All right. Well, thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, here today, we have uh, Brian, Brian Harris and Brian Costa, both from Med Rhythms uh, with us uh, this evening. And I'll, I'll have them introduce themselves here. But um, as a quick intro for everyone as to what Med Rhythms does, Med Rhythms is a digital therapeutics company that uses sensors, music, and software to build evidence-based neurologic interventions to measure and improve walking. Med Rhythms was launched in 2015 out of Spalding Rehab Hospital. Their expert clinicians have since provided nearly 20,000 hours of direct patient care. Due to the profound clinical outcomes and increased demand, the company has launched a digital therapeutics platform to help reach more people. So thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, Brian Harris and Brian Costa, uh, if you guys can give a, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about, about yourselves and, and, and what you do. Well, thanks so much, David. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. And it's always an honor anytime we get an opportunity to talk about the work that we're doing at Med with them. So, so thanks for giving us that opportunity. Um, just a little bit about my background um, and myself. Uh, I'm the co-founder and CEO. Um, I'm a board certified music therapist uh, by training. Um, and I have advanced training in uh, the neuroscience of music and specifically how that can be clinically applied to help people recover from uh, movement language uh, uh, recover from uh, neuro injury or disease in the areas of movement, language, and cognition. It's, it's a field called neurologic music therapy. Um, and uh, I started my career at Spalding Rehab Hospital uh, in Boston, where I was a clinician treating patients hands-on with live music interventions. And, you know, we were seeing patients were getting better faster uh, with greater results. And we now had the neuroscience to not only be able to explain how this was possible, but also how we could standardize and replicate these interventions with uh, uh, many different patients. And so really after starting that program, the, the demand for the services, both from physicians who are asking or writing orders for me to see their patients, but also from patients and their family members who are saying, you know, Brian, you helped my dad walk again. How do I get more of this when I leave the yeah. hospital? And quite frankly, at the time, really the answer was, you know, there's nothing you can do. And that was a that was an awful conversation for me to have with patients and their family members on a regular basis. And yeah. so it was really at that point that we started Med Rhythms to say, how do we bring this important care to people around the world that we not only believe need it, but also believe deserve to have this level um, of care. And so Absolutely. You know, we, we started as a therapy practice and, and uh, Brian Costa can tell you a little bit more about that. Um, and then really from there, we saw just increased demand and a big need. And we then started developing digital therapeutics or, or technology to really help us um, to reach more people. Yeah, that's no, that's so awesome, uh, Brian, to hear. And I think a lot of kind of the innovations in healthcare are, are born out of kind of that, that necessity and that lack of access. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, your journey very much mirrors a lot of what um, at Modus kind of what we experienced as well when we saw kind of these successful therapies, successful uh, treatments in the clinical space uh, being applied for uh, those stroke survivors and those with brain injuries. And then, of course, there being such a limited number of people with access to this. And then when, you know, with insurance and the healthcare system, um, even those with access oftentimes cut off from uh, these these new technologies, these new interventions, uh, way too early, and then kind of uh, you know kind of at some point trying to figure out how do we get this to to more people. So so very cool to hear kind of that 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 origin story, and I think we we very much resonate with a lot of a lot of what you said there. So so Brian Costa, um, I think we have two Brians with us tonight. That's okay. We can we can uh, we'll we'll have Brian Costa and Brian Harris. Brian Costa, please if you you can introduce yourself and and how you got involved with uh, Med Rhythms. Sure. Uh, so I am Brian Costa. I am a board certified music therapist and did the same uh, clinical practice uh, following um, neurologic music therapy um, and am part of the clinical division uh, for Med Rhythms. And I am, uh, in addition to providing in-home services and teletherapy services, uh, also a clinician at um, Spalding Rehab Hospital and um, within the network, the specific hospital is Spalding Cambridge Hospital, which is a long-term acute care hospital. And it's unique in that it has a uh, disorders of consciousness program. Um, so doing a lot of work with, um, you know, initiating movement and speech and um, arousal work, um, just people coming out of their, their comas and, and starting to just 
get reintegrated in the environment around them. Um, and oh, I cool. got involved with Metro them. So uh, Brian Harris and I, we, we went to grad school together and uh, he was always talking to me about it, uh, how he could see uh, the field move in a particular yeah. direction. And I said, love it. Sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> so very much, it sounds like uh, Brian Harris um, kind of, uh, uh, trying to to take you to to the dark side almost though so, <laughs> hey you know you know you're 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 this is a clinical practice you've been trained on but you know let's maybe see if we can do something different here and 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 amplify or multiply the the um the kind of the work that you're doing as an individual clinician um and uh i mean uh, some of the one of the questions that i i oftentimes hear or a get asked about is um you know there's been i'm sure many uh, uh, clinicians in in that that do what you do or has have have been kind of through uh, your that situation you described earlier where you had a a patient that had a lot of success with this treatment and then said oh well can we continue and the answer was sadly no um, you know for whatever reason uh, insurance or or otherwise um, we can't why why do you think and maybe this is this is for Brian Harris Brian wh why do you think it is that um, the situation where uh, you decided to do something different. Why has it taken so long uh, for someone to say, hey, this is uh, something we need to change about what we do, that we are able to, to, to give this service to more people? Yeah, it's an interesting question. When you think about sort of why has this taken so long? And if you look at the field of rehab in general, I mean, rehabilitation is a fairly, uh, actually new field in medicine comparatively to medicine at large. Um, but actually, I was at um, the American Congress of Rehab Medicine a couple of years ago, and the keynote speaker gave this statistic that said that um, from the time that something is discovered in healthcare until it begins to be implemented. So this is not, you know, uh, at scale, but until the early doctor, early adopters begin to implement it mm. on average is 17 years. So we'll think about that for a moment. So from the time we say, hey, this works until we begin to implement it on average in, seven, in, seven, in 17 years. And I think that Absolutely. part of the, you know, the challenge to innovating in healthcare and why this takes so long is that there's many things that need to move in order for true change to happen. And you highlighted, you know, many of that, you know, first is, you know, the, you've got to have doctors willing to prescribe. So, you know, changing behavior of prescribing new technologies or new innovations or new interventions, you've got to have payers willing to pay for it. You know, as you think about um, getting into the field where you're building technologies, you know, you, you may or may not need the FDA to get behind you. Patients need to be willing to do it as well. Um, you know, and I think the other thing that's really interesting to think about is also, we're bringing sort of a um, specific to medrhythms, we're bringing a new intervention. So it's yeah. not just new technology, but it's really based upon the expertise of neurologic music therapists, which frankly, there aren't many in the world that can do this work. And so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of sort of challenges that, that uh, are along the way. But from my perspective, once I figured out that there was a giant need and we potentially had the solution to that need, for me, it was more, I felt like I had the responsibility to do something about it. Um, and then that's really what, what made this all start. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that, that, that lag you highlighted between kind of the science getting there um, and, and finding this effective uh, treatment or, or intervention for something like um, brain injury and the time that it takes for that science to get into clinical practice, that, that kind of 17 year window, and oftentimes even longer than that, and that's, I know, is, can be very frustrating for a lot of, um, a lot of stroke survivors, a lot of uh, brain injury survivors, where um, they'll say, hey, you know, there's this exciting new research that, uh, uh, you know, this doing, doing this is going to help me. And uh, why isn't this something that I can get? Um, that's, I think, a question that, that oftentimes we get as well. Why has it taken so long for there to be um, a, a robotic-based intervention that people can use at home? And um, unfortunately, the, the, the world um, that we live in with the healthcare system that we have, there's a lot of steps that need to be taken. Um, and uh, many of them, you know, very much so necessary for safety, for efficacy, to make sure that we're not, you know, uh, doing, uh, putting out there kind of a hogwash uh, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, it takes oftentimes decades. Um, and uh, I think that that's, that's really tough for, 
for a lot of people. So um, uh, with these new technologies, uh, where, with the question of how, why haven't I heard about this before? Well, you know, it, it does, it takes a lot of time to, for it to get into um, the hands um, and the homes of, of individuals. Um, so very much so, I think at Modus, we also um, share that, 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 uh, um, that, that process with, with you guys. So, so, so music therapy. So let's get into some of the, uh, um, the, the nuts and bolts of it. So how, how does it work? Is it, uh, can you kind of walk our viewers through that? Um, is it just that I listen to a song and, uh, my brain is able to, to rewire and make new connections? How does that work? Yeah. So I, I would say how it works is depending on what goals we're trying to address. Um, you know, in regards to my work worth working with patients and uh, disorders of consciousness, um, our brain is activated by the auditory stimulus. So um, even though it may not look like from the outside that much is going on, the brain is being stimulated and I'm constantly observing behaviors, uh, eye gaze patterns, and even respiratory rate. Is, does it, is it still high? Did it drop? looking at all this and then playing with is it a direct response to the music so playing with silence versus presence of sound um, but then again it looks different in regards to any sensory motor goals that we're working on where it's very much rhythm driven um, and Brian could talk more about that in regards to the device but um, in the same thing for some speech goals that we may, may be working on um, since music really can has these connections across yeah. both um, hemispheres of the brain even though someone may not be able to speak they can sing and with the elements of sure. rhythm and melody melody helps with um, recall of of familiar songs so in the rhythm is driving the let can drive the language out um, and so yeah, for anyone like so, pick it up so, so I mean, that's a really interesting point that, that you brought up there, Brian Costa, that music is very much so kind of in a universal language. We don't, um, we across the world, across cultures, uh, even though we have different cultural upbringings, we learn different languages, we communicate in different ways. Uh, we all have the sense of rhythm, the sense of music, and there's something inherent about that and with the way our brain kind of processes this auditory information. And I think you brought up a, a couple of different uh, applications there with um, the state of consciousness on one side, and then I think speech uh, uh, on uh, speech language, maybe on another, and then finally with, with movement. Um, Brian, maybe you can kind of uh, tell us, uh, there's a, you know, that's a broad range of, of, uh, of conditions. Is, is that, is that uh, do you guys focus, does med rhythms focus on something specific or is it kind of uh, um, uh, looking at all, all these large categories? Yeah, as we think about the, the company at large, I mean, we're focused on uh, neurologic injury or disease. And so our clinical team that Brian Costa is a part of um, is really treating a cross disease state. So stroke, brain injury, okay. uh, Parkinson's disease, MS, et cetera, and across functioning levels from these patients, as he mentioned, with disorders of consciousness, which is very, very low functioning mm -hmm. patients all the way up to what we would consider to be mild uh, injury. So across that board, when we think about the technology application, we are focused very specifically on gait training. So we're focused on improving walking okay. across those disease states from stroke and chronic stroke and brain injury and uh, MS, et cetera, uh, but very focused in on, on walking at that point. Okay, so um, uh, uh, while music has been shown, it sounds like to, to help with all these various states and, and um, clinicians with, with metarhythms um, help um, uh, a large range of of those with brain injuries, um, the one of the primary focuses is helping with walking and helping helping with gait. So how how does that can if you can if you can go through with me? How does that exactly work? And there um, sounds like some music is involved um, sure. and some walking is involved, but maybe help me make those connections between playing the music or hearing the music and and how does that help help my walking? Yeah, it's a great question. And well, I think the sort of the, to start this is the, the foundation, which Brian Costa mentioned of all of this is that what the research shows, and this is really incredible, that, that they've shown through neuroscience and neuroimaging research, that um, when, uh, as humans, when our brains are in the presence of music, so when we just passively listen to music, 
that it engages the parts of our brain that are responsible for movement, language, attention, memory, uh, emotion. Mm -hmm. And there's no other stimulus on earth that engages our brain as globally and simultaneously as music does. It's a powerful stimulus. So that's sort of the passive nature. But number two, where this becomes a really powerful uh, medical intervention is that it's been shown that when you engage in music, that it can aid in the process of neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity being the reason why we can learn new things as we age, because our brains are plastic and they can make new connections yeah. or strengthen yeah. old connections. But also that's the reason why people who have strokes and brain injuries can recover because our brains have this potential to create new connections. And so it's been shown that engaging in music, so that could be anything from literally learning to play an instrument to singing in a choir um, or walking to music, that's active engagement can actually create neuroplasticity. So when we think about uh, that it globally engages our brain in a new way, but also aids in this process of rewiring, so to speak, the brain, that's why it's such a powerful uh, uh, stimulus in, in healthcare. Where this gets really interesting is that it's been shown that that's uh, possible in 97% of the human population. So regardless of age, culture, ability, or disability, even though mu uh, humans have different music preferences, our brains objectively respond the same to music, regardless of our backgrounds, um, which is why this becomes so powerful. So when we think, you know, zoom in on walking, what has been shown is that when our brains hear uh, an external rhythmic stimuli, so when we think about rhythmic stimuli, we think about the beats of music, you know, sure. so think about whether you think about Stevie Wonder, think about Rolling Stones, think about swaying you know, to the song, body. tapping or yeah, exactly. So when we think about beats of music, so the rhythm actually engages our auditory system in our brain because it's an auditory cue. So we're getting it through our ears. But the research shows that our auditory system and our motor system are actually subconsciously connected, which means that our auditory system can activate our motor system without us having to even think about it. So what happens is that when we um, hear a steady rhythm in our environment, like Stevie Wonder, that's actually giving our, uh, our motor system or the part of our brain that's responsible for movement, a cue to activate or a cue to move with the music. Um, one of the things that I, and I, that I do this, and I, I've been very fortunate to be able to, to, to travel the world and give presentations about music and neuroscience. When I talk about this point, um, and this is what we call auditory motor entrainment. So what it means is that essentially your auditory system and your motor system are firing in synchrony with that external rhythmic cue. So sure. the auditory rhythm's coming in, activating your auditory system, it's grabbing your motor system and they're firing in synchrony. And at this point, I would always do uh, a demonstration where I pick somebody random from the crowd that I've never met before, and I ask them to walk to a certain tempo. So I'll, I'll put on just a metronome, so just a click track, ask them to walk at a couple of different tempos. And then I put on a, 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 a metronome at about 100 beats per minute, which is about the average cadence of an adult human. And I ask them to try to not to walk to the beat of the music. <laughs> And it's almost impossible to do because yeah. you uh, actually have to come up with some sort of cognitive strategy to not listen to the rhythm in your environment because the, the rhythm is literally telling your brain to tell your body to move. You almost and have so to that, play it like a different song in your head with a different correct. beat to, to overcome this this uh, input of uh, doing this. Yeah, this this walk. No, I, I can definitely imagine. And I always tell people, hey, if you ever want to try this out, get a metronome, put it at 100 to 105 beats per minute and go sit in a park somewhere and blast it on a <laughs> street. And uh, what you'll see is that as people walk within earshot of the metronome, even if they're in conversation with somebody else who's walking with them, they will walk in synchrony with that rhythmic cue because it's subconsciously telling their brain to tell their body to move. So that's for what we would call neurologically healthy individuals. Where it gets much more compelling is that people who have damage to the motor system, so that would be stroke, um, uh, you know, brain injury, CBI, heart yeah. disease, MS, MS, whatever it may be, that uh, we can use the rhythm to serve as an external cue to engage that motor system to function more appropriately like it did pre-injury or pre-diagnosis. So, so helping, so maybe helping with something like initiation. Um, is, is what we're talking about here, if I may. Uh, is, that, is that kind of uh, uh, something that, that, that music can help with? So it's someone that they know they, they, 
uh, they're looking to engage their uh, move their foot or or you know take a stride, um, but they have trouble with with starting or initiate initiation or keeping some kind of steady uh, steady uh, walk. Is that kind of the type of of uh, uh, brain injury survivor that would benefit from from music therapy? Yeah, I mean it's it's initiation, and uh, you know Brian Costa can speak to this as well. But it's really overall motor control. I mean, it's not just initiation that that the research does show that it can be helpful there. But as we think about the clinical benefits of this intervention, you know, and um, you know maybe you probably as we go along here, we can talk a little bit more about sort of what the intervention looks like. But as people walk to music, they walk better to music. So they have better overall control. Their gait speed can improve. Their uh, stride length can improve. Those who have strokes, their symmetry improves due to the uh, cueing that their brain's getting from the rhythm. So it's really gait yeah. at large. Yeah. And, and I think that you talked about as well, one of these principles of, of, of neurohab, of, of, of practice, of, um, you know, doing the thing is oftentimes one of the best ways to kind of train ourselves. Um, uh, whether that kind of sometimes could be uh, through imagining walking or, or seeing yourself walk to, of course, doing the walking yourself, uh, uh, actually trying to, to uh, move uh, at, at your gait at a specific tempo. And then, and then it sounds like using music to help guide that process, whether to help speed it up or maybe in some cases even slow it down. Um, and and uh, um, that, that in the hands of a, uh, it sounds like a, um, an auditory uh, clinician that's 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 um, been trained in in kind of um, the 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 using music um, to be able to kind of guide a a brain injury survivor to finding um, or improving their 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 gait speed their gait how far they can walk as well in their endurance um, and then um, uh, maybe with uh, uh, their their posture and things like that does that sound kind of uh, maybe as a, as a summary of, of how, how music interacts with, um, with walking. I, I, yes, yes is the, the short answer. I would say, <laughs> um, some, some things to kind of consider is, um, because even one of the earlier questions that you, you had asked, um, I, I think it's the idea of like, it's easy to just like put on some music and think that like some changes are going to happen. I mean, it depends yeah. on, on what it is, but at, within the clinical practices, um, you know, what we do in terms of the actual intervention for, in, in regards to um, gait, it's rhythmic auditory stimulation, is um, figure out the baseline of the, the client or the patient and, and, and see how they're moving. And if, if it's, if it would, if they benefit from going faster, then absolutely. But we also don't want to sacrifice the quality of their gait just for speed. And I, I mean, I've had plenty of sessions where I am trying to slow down people. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes some folks have a short shuffle gait, so their their beats are going to be really high. And so my job is to musically, how do we shape it so that they are able to take bigger steps? And maybe it is with verbal cueing as well. Um, but it's really the music is driving the movement in the change. Um, I know, especially, I mean, not right now, because of, uh, you know, circumstances with the pandemic, but when family members are in and visitors, I mean, sometimes even some like uh, new hires at the hospital, when they they see some of these sessions, they, they think, oh, the music's great. They're like, it's like a distractor. And I, mm -hmm. you know, it's a lot of uh, educating of it's actually it, it's doing it's driving them forward it's doing the yeah. work um, yeah it's not in the background it's very much part of uh the active therapy that they're receiving to help uh, uh their their gait be more stable more balanced um more more uh, uh safe uh, maybe yeah. as well and uh no that that's fantastic and it sounds like just using this inherent all of our inherent uh uh communication connection with music in our brains to rather than telling somebody hey this is maybe how you can improve your gait um, and it's easy to say you know oh um, you know I want you to uh, 
um, you know, when I think of uh, playing a musical instrument, uh, I, I want you to uh, do hold, hold um, the, the clarinet higher. I want you to try to breathe uh, with, um, uh, 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 you know, a more focused air into, into the clarinet rather than telling them what to do, um, playing the music and allowing the music to directly communicate you almost at a sub language, sub, sub, uh, sub English, I guess in, in our cases, you know, we're communicating uh, with English sub language level of, um, giving them, um, a rhythm to follow that might be much easier for them to uh, uh, um, internalize this. Oh, I need to slow down. Oh, I need to speed up. Um, than just saying, "Hey, I, I think you you can benefit from uh, slowing down your gait or speeding up your gait." So that's that's uh, that's really interesting. Um, if 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 I if I have that um, kind of correct as to to how you guys are interacting with with gait. It's a good it's a good interpretation um, of it actually, and it's it's interesting because as we talk about. Um, the science of this, you know, and a lot of people always come back to, oh, well, you know, I love putting on music and, and I move when music's on, or I love walking to music. And that's the underlying premise of this. But, you know, the intervention is much more, uh, you know, it has to be customized. It has to be delivered to that person based upon where they're functioning. But what's yeah. really interesting is we now have such a neural understanding of what's happening in music that we talk about it actually as a mechanism of action which is interesting because the, the mechanism of action, that term is typically used in um, pharmaceutical land. That's how drug companies sure. talk about how their drugs work is here's how the interaction of the chemicals with the biology, et cetera. Um, but we're actually now knowing that when we use music, that there's a real mechanism of action happening in the brain as it's connecting the auditory and motor system in a way that nothing else can. Um, and yeah. that's what really makes it such a profound intervention. Very cool. So, so, okay. So we've talked about how music can help, um, as a intervention. So tell me about more about med rhythms. So specifically, how are you, how is med rhythms interacting using music therapy? Um, is it some kind of device that I get? Is it a, a website that I go to? How, tell me more about that. Yeah. I mean, there's two, two primary ways that we're, we're seeking to help people. One is through our clinical practice, which is board certified music therapists and neurologic music therapists like Brian Costa. And with that uh, team of, of uh, amazing clinicians, we treat patients both um, inpatient, so in hospitals, um, as we mentioned, so we have contracts with hospitals. We see people on an outpatient basis. Um, we see uh, people in their homes, so we do in-home care. Um, and then uh, in the middle of the pandemic, we also launched a teletherapy practice with those clinicians. So they actually can do live therapy via Zoom it's much more complex than that, but you know they can do video yeah. sessions of, of teletherapy. So that's one way that uh, you can access you know, clinical care from, from MedRhythms. And then the other uh, side of this is where we've been really focused on building digital therapeutics, um, as I mentioned, which are really focused on uh, gait training, really focused on improving walking following neurologic disease or injury. Um, and when we call them digital therapeutics, essentially these are products that um, actually look a lot like drugs in terms of their outcomes. So it's drug-like outcomes. They go through rigorous clinical uh, research. They're FDA approved uh, or FDA regulated and, and prescription products. Sure. Um, the difference is that it's the software or the technology that's yep. delivering the intervention, not Absolutely. the drug. So basically what our platform looks like is we have sensors that connect to the shoe that collect clinical grade biomechanics in real time. So things like the symmetry, the stride, like the cadence that I just mentioned to you, that feeds into our algorithm, which is based upon a mobile device. And then we deliver music via headphones. Um, we call it a, it's a closed loop system, meaning that it can adjust in real time to how the patient is walking. So as the data comes in from the sensors on the shoe, it's telling the algorithm clinically what's happening. And then the music is being adjusted by our algorithms to, uh, to treat the patient accordingly. And we sort of call it, uh, the algorithms are um, uh, individualized, challenging and progressive. So they're Absolutely. individualized in the sense that they're customized to that person based upon how they're functioning in that moment on that day. Yep. They're challenging in the sense that it's an intervention. So we're pushing you somewhere. So we're going to make the, the intervention difficult. Um, 
but also it's progressive. And then not, not only are we just adding difficulty to the intervention, but we're actually pushing the patients towards their functional goals of where they're trying to get to. Um, so essentially what we've done is we've used algorithms to replicate Brian Costa's brain of how he <laughs> would treat patients in the hospital. We now can do that with algorithms for this very specific intervention. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, in regards to you talking about um, uh, the, the, really the principles of, of motor learning or principle, I should even say just just learning in general, this goal directed, this kind of uh, uh, progressive, um, um, having an appropriate difficulty. I think for many of uh, those uh, viewers that are familiar with the modus hand and modus foot, uh, very much so uh, also familiar with these principles that also I think we talk about uh, with our devices um, in this, this closed loop system of having sensors that, that um, detect the needs and current ability of an individual and then providing a, um, a, the, imp uh, the appropriate challenge, um, whether that be through a uh, mechanical interface that, that we have where we physically are moving um, in a robotic exoskeleton to do rehab. Um, or in, in uh, I think, uh, in the Red Med Rhythms case, a uh, um, intervention with, with um, music, um, with headphones, and uh, um, having an appropriate kind of cadence or, or music coming through to, to assist in the movement, um, and then having then that immediate feedback from the sensors as well. Um, that's kind of really the application of technology to what a lot of clinicians do um, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And, and um, at Modus, you know, we're we're, I think, very much on the same boat of um, in the belief that using technology, we can help um, expand the access of uh, uh, brain injury survivors, patients in general, to this high quality clinician based uh, 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 in, uh, kind of uh, treatment uh, rehab. Um, but to replicate a lot of that through a, a mechanical device or taking on a lot of the um, the more onerous day to day, you know, needing thousands of repetitions, hundreds of thousands of repetitions sometimes, um, and having it configured in a machine, and then maybe having the clinician rather kind of engage and every single minute more manage the the uh, the, the service and the uh, the intervention. Um, so that's that's very cool to hear that you know very much. So I think both for Modus and for Med Rhythms, uh, thinking along. Um, similar lines to apply a what is known to be scientifically proven uh, rehab that works, but using then technology to kind of um, uh, bring that to to more people with more access. So is this a device that maybe I can get today for just I think many of our viewers would be curious to hear? Um, is this um, this app? It sounds like something that runs on my phone. Um, is this something that I, I and and then this uh, or something orthosis or maybe something that I put it into my shoe is, is this something that I can that I can get today? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I do want to mention too, I, you know, I very much enjoy talking about this, this sort of concept of access and bridging this gap because when we think about technology and innovation. I mean, that's really the promise of, of new technologies is being able to deliver high value clinical interventions Absolutely. without the need of a one-to-one -one patient to clinician ratio, literally anywhere throughout the world where somebody needs it. And yes. I think, that, you know, as we think about innovation and, and what's re what becomes really interesting is that there's also, as I mentioned, there's 3000 people in the world that are trained as neurologic music therapists to deliver. Um, for, for context, 3, 000, there's 3000 people in the world. Sure. In the United States, the biggest physical therapy company has 10,000 sure. employees and they sure. own about 3% of the physical therapy market. So the scale difference is, is, is crazy, right? So we see this in, in, in our work uh, with Spalding, you know, it's Harvard Medical School affiliate for neuro rehab hospitals. You know, we're seeing gap there of when patients leave the hospital, that there's a gap in services. And so certainly yep. technologies like the ones that we're building could be help, uh, you know, for, for gaps there. But, you know, we're talking about, I come from a very, very small town in uh, central Maine where people are driving 45 miles at least to get access to a primary care doctor, Absolutely. let alone a specialist or a yep. neurologist um, or specialty rehab. And there are areas like that all over the country that don't have all access. All over the world, yeah. All over the world, exactly. All over the world who don't have access to basic medical needs, let alone specialty care. And these types of new interventions are really gonna change the game, I think, in allowing 
high skilled interventions from the Harvard medical schools of the world to be delivered um, to somebody's home. And I think that that's really exciting. Um, but as it relates to sort of your question about Medrhythm's products, um, our first uh, product that we are building is for the chronic stroke uh, population. So these are, you know, sort of as defined typically that three to six months post stroke. Um, and we are um, still in, we're, we're in, we're in clinical trials right now and okay. we are pre FDA yep. approval. Um, and, uh, you know, that's in the hopefully not too distant future, but that's what we're, yeah. we're moving towards right now. So uh, not commercially available at the moment. However, you know, um, hopefully will not be too long. Very cool. Very cool. No, absolutely. And I, I think that kind of to to uh, emphasize uh, with kind of the process that you guys are going through um, with the modus hand and the modus foot, um, you know, we've that that our the technology that 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 our devices are based on. I was talking to um, Ryan Costa earlier about this as well, really started in the mid 2000s, almost 20 years ago at this point. Um, and the conceptualization from taking what is constraint induced movement therapy, this idea of we're going to focus really on the impaired uh, side, the impaired limb and uh, get hundreds or thousands of hours of repetitions of movements um, to, to kind of retrain the brain to to reactivate uh, or rewire to to activate the muscles and to coordinate all the, the movements that are necessary to have meaningful uh, functional movement. Um, having that concept uh, go from uh, uh, into a robotic device, going through clinical trials. Um, so we did our clinical trials. It's a randomized um, multi-site controlled trial with the Cleveland Clinic and Emory University um, uh, with uh, 100 individuals. And that was kind of, you know, mid to 2010. So at this point already, um, you know, about something like six or seven years into it. Um, uh, into into the technology and where we are today, where we've just uh, most you know recently uh, uh, about a year into our home deployment of our devices, and to thinking back to that that original quote that you said it takes about seventeen years, uh, we are at this point actually about seventeen and a half years since two thousand three, the original inception of this idea of having a robotic exoskeleton be a um, a surrogate for uh, a physical therapist and occupational therapists and the movement therapies that they do um, and having this physical, this device that, that can replicate those movements, replicate the movements of a therapist, having sensors on board, being able to recognize the movements an individual has. Um, it really has taken about 17 or so years. So very much matching, I think, um, we had mentioned earlier, being at the uh, uh, at ACRM, the American Congress for Rehab Medicine. Um, and uh, I, 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 it would be, I think, remiss to not give a shout out here at this point with uh, to Dr. Nick Housley, who was, I think, invited um, in this most recent um, ACRM, American Congress for Rehab Medicine um, uh, conference. I think it was in March as a panelist for um, as a speaker for one of the sessions um, for uh, I think I believe it was called Leveling Up, um, the introduction of gaming into uh into rehab medicine so i'll uh, definitely give a shout out to dr nick housley there um for uh, for participating in that but kind of going back to how long it takes uh, i think very much so you know we we are you know cheering you guys on in in um in these clinical trials it is extremely important to be able to um show in a randomized controlled sense uh that um doing something different uh, versus kind of the gold standard of care or the, the customary and usual care, how um, there could be an improvement in what patients are receiving at the end of the day. Um, so hopefully maybe in the next couple of years, um, we can see the results to that, to those studies and 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 get into the literal hands and ears, I think, of, of stroke survivors and of, um, of those with brain injuries um, uh, all around the world. So um, now, uh, is this a home-based device? And I think for us, you know, very much, we started in, the, in clinics and hospitals. Our devices, as, as many of our viewers know, are in 200 clinics and hospitals all over the country. And now we've had a big shift into the home. Do you imagine this, Brian, being a, a home-based device or a clinic-based device? 
Yeah, I mean, as we designed it, um, it's a, a, a device that's uh, to be used autonomously in the home without the need of a clinician present. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we think about down the road, uh, certainly could be, there's no reason it couldn't be used in a clinic setting um, at some point, but really we're, we're focused on, you know, where there's those millions of people that are currently living in home um, without access to, to the clinicians. And so that's where we're focused on at first. Yeah. So, yeah, we very much so, I think our devices first were introduced to clinics and hospitals due to high cost. Um, it's, it was a $20,000 device and it, it took a lot of engineering to bring out down the robotic exoskeleton, to something that was affordable at home. And now we're able to deploy directly into homes um, and, and do sessions uh, between clinicians and kind of the, doing these telehealth sessions on, on our devices. Um, is now, is that, is that part of what you see? Is this going to be something that I purchase? Maybe this is too early to, to even talk about. Is it something that I, that I purchase or was it, would this be provided to me through a, a rehab program of, of some kind? You know, as we think about building an organization and we think about access, right? Where yeah. do you get true access? It's reimbursement, right? So yeah. our focus, and you know, we, we're starting on that path now. But the you know the vision here is that um, this is reimbursed by um, you know both 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 private and public payers, such that there's no um, cost barrier to the individuals to be able to get access to it. So yeah. you know that's what we're working on now. I think it's early to say exactly how that shakes out, um, but you know that's really the vision here. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've we've been that's kind of been a quagmire we've been as well through in the past, um, I would say, five, five years of trying to even with, um, you know, the, the modus hand modus for our FDA class one devices. We've had about two dozen clinical trials um, um, and, uh, you know, Spalding's is one of the hospitals we also collaborate collaborate with uh, Dr. Randy Trumbauer there in Spalding, um, uh, one of our um, uh, on our clinical advisory board. Um, and, uh, it's, it's been, it's very difficult to get payers to recognize the value that's added, um, uh, with, with these types of new therapies and, um, and, and getting them to actually, um, you know, recognize the, the need for there to be a financial ability for, for patients to, 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 um, have access to these new tools. So certainly, you know, we'll be interested to, to see, um, and, and uh, uh, maybe we can compare notes as well as to how how to best um, uh, approach that that um, that 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 footprint that a footprint to get that re reimbursement. A lot of um, for some of our users, uh, we're having success with reimbursement of uh, therapy services delivered through uh, our platform. So PT and OT uh, uh, sessions that are delivered via telehealth, those can be reimbursed by insurance. But by and large, the equipment is very much so outside of, um, you know, there's not currently a code for it. And then it's, it's a very long process to, to do, uh, to get um, recognition for that. And that's something that, that we've, uh, are very actively um, in the process of, of trying to, to overcome as well. So, so uh, very much, I think, you know, um, it, it's certainly a challenge of the healthcare system holding back technology, bringing access to um, a lot of these kind of known th known therapies that help people. We, we see help people. We can see in clinical trials are are are, are very effective in uh, helping stroke survivors and those with brain injuries. But then, kind of the mechanics of uh, the end, logistics of of um, who who's going to pay at the end of the day. Um, something that that is a big barrier. Well, well thank you so much, uh, Brian uh, Brian Costa and Brian Harris for 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 joining us um, today. Uh, and, and kind of giving us insight into how music uh, can be applied to a lot of the rehab technologies. Um, and uh, certainly, you know, we'll, uh, we'll post um, in, the, in the show notes here uh, uh, links to, to uh, your website and maybe, and I think you talked about that you guys have services in clinics all um, across the, the country in addition to just in Boston and Spalding. Is that, is that right? Maybe uh, uh, tell our users where they can find you guys. Yeah, so our uh, we have two websites. So for our digital therapeutics practice um, and sort of the products that we're building there, and um, it's www.medrhythms.com. Um, and then for our therapy practice, uh, where we're doing in-person therapy, in-home, in-clinic, and through teletherapy, so we can now treat patients anywhere throughout the world, um, it's www.medrhythmstherapy. Uh, dot com. Um, and through that, uh, you can find all the contact information to, to reach out to our team. Very good. Very good. And hopefully, you know, uh, for some of our users, if, if, if music involving music is something that's, uh, that's going to help them in their recovery process, we very much hope that, that they reach out to you guys and, um, 
have, uh, you know, whatever, whatever we can do to, to kind of uh, get the word out there uh, for, for med rhythms and for you guys and anything that could help. Um, I think um, anyone with a brain injury, we're very much supportive of. Well, thank you guys so much for, for joining us um, this evening. And, uh, you know, we look forward to, uh, to uh, kind of um, as, as we try to progress technology in the rehab space and, and bring more access to those with brain injuries, um, you know, hopefully we can push forward the field and, uh, and make very much um, a, a norm to use uh, new technologies to, to assist and be part of the general rehab experience um, and, you know, uh, hopefully help a lot of people all around the world. So thank, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And back to you, Dr. Nick.